Hello, and welcome to today's session on feline infectious diseases. I'm Dr. Julie Levy from the College of Veterinary Medicine. There are literally hundreds of infectious diseases of cats, and it will not be possible to cover all of them in detail today. So I've selected the most clinically important ones and ones that will be important to understand for the exam that you'll be taking. I'd like to start with a very common infectious disease of cats, that's feline leukemia virus. This is a virus that belongs to the uncornavirus family. That means it's a retrovirus. The typical patient that's affected by feline leukemia virus is really a cat of any age, but kittens are most susceptible. The sex ratio of cats infected with this virus is approximately equal between male and female cats, or perhaps slightly overrepresented with males. And there is a strong age-related resistance to cats that have this virus. So adult cats are much harder to infect with feline leukemia virus than our kittens. It takes a direct exposure from one infected cat to another to pass this virus from cat to cat. Prolonged close contact, typically cats living together or from mother to kitten are most common. Outdoor fighting cats are at higher risk than indoor cats that live alone. Transmission can be either vertical, meaning from mother to kitten before or after birth via the placenta or milk, or horizontal, especially via saliva transmission from mutual grooming, or in urine from bites or fomites. Infection can be transient, meaning that cats recover from this infection, persistent for life, or latently infected. Lately infected cats are still carrying the virus, but it's undetectable to us by any of our routine tests. Outbreaks are not common with feline leukemia virus. We can frequently have a minority of cats in a household infected, except for the case in kittens in which a whole litter may be infected. What are the clinical signs associated with this virus? Most commonly found is a non-regenerative anemia. This is a severe anemia with PCDs that may be as low as 10% or less. Occasionally, these anemias are actually microcytic. We can also see lymphosarcoma occurring especially in the finest multicentric forms or hepatosplenic forms. Myeloproliferative diseases and other kinds of leukemias affecting the bone marrow are also observed. Ultimately, cats develop a wasting syndrome and are also susceptible to opportunistic infections caused by immunosuppression with this virus. And most cats die within three years of diagnosis. Diagnosis is typically made by ELISA testing for antigen or the virus itself in whole blood, serum, or plasma. Although testing has been available in the past for tears and saliva, we do not consider these to be reliable tests and do not recommend them. Immunofluorescent antibody testing for antigen on blood smears or on bone marrow smears can also be performed by reference laboratories, and a positive IFA test does mean that cats are going to be persistently infected for life. It's also possible now to do PCR testing, which tests for the viral nucleic acids, and we do not use antibody tests for this particular test. Many uninfected cats have been exposed and do produce antibodies. Also, vaccination against this virus will produce antibodies. So many cats in nature have antibodies against leukemia virus but are not infected. Therefore, we must rely on our antigen test for detecting this virus. There is no therapy specifically for feline leukemia virus that is not completely effective. AZT, an antiviral drug, can be used, but it's very expensive, and we don't know if it works very well long term. And the immunomodulators, such as interferon, are very popular, but none of them have been proven to be effective. Mostly we're left with treating the secondary conditions and, and infections that occur in these cats. Prevention is best made by pre preventing exposure to infected cats. If we have infected cats in a household, we can effectively quarantine those cats by putting them in a separate room. It's not necessary to wash hands or change clothing while coming out of the rooms because it does require direct cat-to-cat -cat contact. We want to prevent nosocomial transmission, which is transmission of this virus in the, in the hospitals, so we should never reuse needles or surgical instruments without sterilizing them first between cats. Vaccination is available. It is a killed vaccine. It is considered to be a non-core vaccine for cats, and so we recommend it only for cats that are at risk. These would be cats that are free roaming outdoors 
or that live with positive or untested cats. The virus is very readily inactivated by routine disinfectants, and it has poor environmental persistence, so it's easy to remove it from a contaminated person. Feline immunodeficiency virus is the next virus we'll discuss. This is also a retrovirus in another family called lentiviruses. This is the same family that HIV occurs in in people. In this case, the typical patient is a mature adult fighting male cat. Transmission is primarily from bite wounds from infected, infected cats to the susceptible cat. Vertical transmission from mother to kitten is very uncommon, and this is in contrast to leukemia virus. Once cats become infected, they do not recover, and they are considered infected for life. Outbreaks, again, are not considered typical for this infection since it requires direct cat-to-cat -cat contact, and it's a, a very difficult virus to transmit. Clinical signs of FIV infection occur after years of infection, not early on. There's a wasting syndrome, there are opportunistic infections that can occur, blood dyspraxia such as anemia and leukemia. Stomatitis is one of the most common diseases that we see. This is inflammation of the mouth. We can also see lymphosarcoma, especially in extranodal or at unusual sites. And cats infected with FIV have a very long prodromal or preclinical sign, lasting years usually, before they show any clinical signs of disease. Diagnosis of FIV is, is made by testing for antibodies. Because the virus level in the blood is too low to detect with an antigen test, and because exposure leads to infection for life, the antibody tests are very reliable. Typically, in the clinic, we'll use an ELISA screening test and then a Western blot in a reference lab to confirm infection. And these can be performed on whole blood, serum, or plasma. It's very important to note that kittens are uncommonly infected. However, kittens can get antibodies from the mother when they nurse on the mother's colostrum. So kittens that are born to an FIV-infected queen are very unlikely to become infected themselves, but they will have false positive antibody test results because of the antibodies that they get from the mother. There is no optimal antiviral therapy for, eight, for FIV-infected cats. AZT is effective for some diseases, such as seizure disorders, but it's not used for most cats. Immunomodulators, again, are very popular, but are not proven to help cats. So we are left, again, with treating the related diseases that occur in these infected cats. Prevention, again, is primarily performed by preventing exposure to infected cats. Again, this disease requires direct cat-to-cat -cat contact for transmission, so we can segregate a positive household simply by keeping cats in different rooms should prevent cats from roaming and fighting to prevent exposure to these cats by biting. And no vaccine is currently available, although we may see the first FIV vaccine become available in 2002. Again, the virus is very easily inactivated with routine disinfectants, and it has poor stability in the environment. So it is easy to clean up the environment after FIV-infected cat has been in, in the place. Let's move now to feline coronavirus. This is the agent of feline infectious peritonitis. It's in the picornavirus family and causes two diseases. One is enteric, feline enteric coronavirus, which is a very mild gastrointestinal disease, versus feline infectious peritonitis, which is a very severe and deadly consequence of infection. In this case, the typical feline patient is less than two years old and is found predominantly in purebred cats and cats from catteries, in marked contrast to finding FIV and FELV in free-roaming stray cats. Transmission is by fecal oral transmission. Many chronic shedding cats are completely asymptomatic and never have signs of disease. The non-pathogenic form of the virus, feline enteric coronavirus, may mutate within the cat to become the virulent FIP strain after the cat is infected. Expression of FIP disease we now know is largely dependent on the genetic background of the cat. So various cats in the household may be infected with the same virulent strain of disease, and only certain cats that are genetically predisposed will actually develop clinical illness. Again, we do not expect to see outbreaks of this disease or a large percentage of exposed cats becoming sick. 
clinical signs of feline enteric coronavirus are generally very mild gastrointestinal signs, such as diarrhea or anorexia. Most cats are subclinical, and we never see signs of disease. In contrast, cats that have FIP become very ill. We frequently see intermittent fevers that are not responsive to antibiotics, neurologic signs if the virus affects the, the central nervous system, rapid weight loss is a hallmark of this disease. They also get inflammatory eye diseases such as uveitis and chorioretinitis and also can get two forms of the disease. In the wet forms, there is a marked large accumulation of viscous yellow clear ascites or pleural effusion that occurs in this wet form of disease. In the dry form, it's much more difficult to diagnose. This is caused by a vasculitis and pyogranuloma formations in blood vessels and various organs. Signs in this case are due to unregulated immune response. And death usually in sick cats occurs within weeks to months after clinical signs of disease appear. Diagnosis of FIP can be very difficult because our diagnostic blood tests are not very reliable. If we're lucky and we see hyperproteinemia or high blood proteins in the serum, that is very consistent with FIP. And if we do protein electrophoresis in these cats, we see that they have a polyclonal gammopathy. Hyperproteinemia may be more common in the dry form of FIP than in the wet form. If they have an effusion that is characterized by high protein, low to moderate pyogranulomatous cellularity, and no evidence of bacterial infection, this is very consistent with the wet form of FIP and makes diagnosis much easier. We do have the availability of coronavirus antibodies. However, at least half of cats have been exposed to one form of coronavirus or another, and so they do carry antibodies. Since less than 1% of all cats will develop FIP, this test is not very specific. However, if the antibody titer is very high, this does have some consistency with infection, but we should never diagnose FIP infection purely from the presence of a positive antibody titer. There is no virus or antigen test available at this time. PCR for the virus nucleic acid sequences is available and is quite controversial, and most researchers feel that this test is still unreliable for distinguishing the pathogenic form of, it, of coronavirus from the non-pathogenic form. And biopsies or necropsies should also be performed because there are characteristic biopsy findings of vasculitis and pyogranulomatous disease that the biopsy can pick up. This is largely an untreatable disease once cats become ill with infection. There is no antiviral therapy that's been shown to be effective against FIP. Immune suppression using prednisone or other cytotoxic drugs is our treatment of choice because remember that this disease is an immune-mediated, unregulated immune response to the virus. But this is palliative only, and cats are likely to relapse with clinical signs within several weeks to several months. Prevention is very difficult because there's a widespread carrier state of coronavirus in households. It is a very stable virus in the environment and can last for several weeks, making it very difficult to disinfect. However, if we do have the opportunity to treat an area with the routine disinfectants, they, the virus can be eliminated, but it does not die on its own. So since many catteries are in people's own homes and they can't use disinfectants on all the surface of the homes, the virus can, in the environment, remain a source of infection. Some groups have reported decreasing cases of FIP in breeding situations when early weaning, weaning kittens as early as four weeks of age, and hand-rearing them to get them away from their mother who's shedding the virus has reduced infection rates. Selection of disease-resistant breeding stock is very important since we now understand that the genetic background of the cat is one of the primary causes for the disease. And there is a vaccine available. It is of disputed efficacy. It's an intranasal attenuated live virus vaccine. It is considered a non-core vaccine and is only administered to cats at risk. Let's move now to feline panleukopenia viruses. 
This is a parvovirus similar to the parvovirus that affects dogs. It's called feline panleukopenia virus, and colloquially it's referred to as feline distemper. The typical patient is a kitten with inadequate passive immunity from the mother or inadequate vaccination when the kitten's a little bit older. There is a marked age-related resistance to this infection so that adult cats, even if they have not been vaccinated, are frequently quite resistant, whereas kittens are highly susceptible. Transmission is by fecal-oral transmission, also by fomites. This is a very resistant virus being a parvovirus to disinfect it, so it's very easy for us to carry this from room to room or cage to cage in the hospital, and it is a highly infectious disease. So outbreaks in this particular virus are very common when they do occur in a susceptible population. Clinical signs of panleukopenia virus in the cat are severe fevers, serious vomiting and diarrhea leading to very profound dehydration, sudden death in some cases, and kittens that are infected in utero before birth can develop underdeveloped cerebellums leading to an ataxia syndrome and intention tremor after birth. This can also occur when pregnant mother cats are vaccinated with live virus distemper vaccines prior to birth. Diagnosis is made largely clinical by the classic clinical presentation of vomiting and diarrhea. On the CBC, we see a marked panleukopenia with frequently less than 500 white blood cells. And we can use the parvo fecal test that's designed for use in dogs on cats to detect this virus as well. Treatment is intensive supportive care, just like it would be in a puppy with parvovirus. With, with adequate care, most of these kittens should be saved. That requires IV fluids, IV antibiotics, anti-emetic medication, and plasma or whole blood to support the kittens as needed. Prevention is widely available in the form of very, very reliable vaccines. These are available as either killed or modified live vaccines, and this is considered a core vaccine in that every cat should be vaccinated well as kittens and then at least every three years afterwards against panleukopenia virus. Passive immunization, either from colostrum from the kittens or with immune serum that's administered to, to the kittens for failure of passive transfer, will also protect kittens against panleukopenia virus. This, being a parvovirus, is an agent that is highly resistant to routine disinfectants, and it can last in the environment for more than a year, and bleach is essentially the only effective disinfectant for this virus. Well, let's now talk about the upper respiratory virus infections of cats. The first one is herpes virus. It can affect cats of any age. There's no particular age-related resistance that occurs with this virus, although it does appear that kittens or immunosuppressed you know, cats can have more serious clinical signs. It is rapidly passed among cats, especially cats that are housed in groups such as animal shelters and catteries. Transmission is by oral nasal transmission, by sneezing, or by fomites. It's very easy to carry this particular highly infectious disease from cat to cat or room to room on our clothing or our hands. There are chronic asymptomatic carriers that can pass this virus without being sneezing themselves. And it can also become a persistent virus that is reactivated years later when the cat becomes immunosuppressed or stressed for any reason. Clinical signs are the typical signs of upper respiratory infection. This would be fever, sneezing, nasal discharge, corneal ulcers, and conjunctivitis. Diagnosis really is a diagnosis that's clinically made and not usually confirmed based on clinical signs. If it's essential to make an accurate diagnosis, the, the cats can be cultured for virus using pharyngeal swabs, and immunofluorescent antibody tests can be performed on conjunctival scrapes. Treatment is really palliative and supportive for the week to two weeks it takes most cats to resolve this infection. Antiviral agents are too toxic to be used on cats systemically, but they can be used for severe ocular disease, such as persistent corneal ulcers. And antibiotics are administered as needed to control the secondary bacterial infections that cats get after they have this primary virus infection. 
Prevention is by vaccination using either killed or modified live vaccines. These vaccines will reduce the severity of disease if a cat becomes infected, but they do not prevent the infection itself. This is a core vaccine, and all kittens and cats should be vaccinated against this virus. Prevention is also important by reducing exposure to infected cats and fomites, and in shelter situations or hospital situations, hygiene, good air exchanges, and segregation of cats by age group and susceptibility is very important to prevent transmission. Outbreaks are very common with this disease, and it may survive up to 18 hours in the environment. So again, it can persist if you're not having good cleaning in your hospital. It's very easy to transmit this from cat to cat. Khaleesi virus is the other common virus implicated in upper respiratory infections. Again, cats of any age can be affected. They are cats that are exposed to other cats, especially in group housing, such as shelters, hospitals, and catteries. It is more severe in immature cats or immunosuppressed cats. Transmission, like herpes virus, is by oral nasal transmission, fomites. It again is highly infectious and outbreaks are common. Again, cats can carry this virus in an asymptomatic state and shed it without being sick themselves. And they can become chronic carriers and have the latent infections reactivated if they're immunosuppressed or become stressed. Clinical signs are very similar to those of herpes virus. There's a fever, sneezing, nasal discharge. Khaleesi virus also causes a very common or very unique limping arthritis of kittens. There's a shifting febrile polyarthritis that occurs after either vaccination or natural infection. And this uh, is self-limiting. It's very severe, but it lasts only for a few days and then cats fully recover and there's no specific therapy that's required for this arthritis other than perhaps pain control. Oral ulceration of the tongue and palate are also seen with Khaleesi virus, and recently there's been outbreaks of a more severe form of this virus uh, called hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, pancreatitis, leading to death in cats, and this has been occurring in some shelters as well. Again, Khaleesi virus, like herpes virus, is diagnosed primarily on clinical signs using virus culture of pharyngeal swabs if we feel it's necessary, and treatment is largely symptomatic. There are no specific antiviral agents available. Antibiotics are administered for the secondary infections, and if they get the arthritis syndrome, that resolves spontaneously. Prevention, again, is by vaccination using either killed or modified live virus vaccines. Again, these vaccines do not prevent infection, but they do reduce the severity of infection if it does occur. We want to redu reduce exposure of infected cats and fomites to our unprotected animals, meaning that hygiene, air exchanges, and segregating by age, again, is very important in any population of cats. And this virus may survive up to a week in the environment. It is very susceptible to routine disinfectants, but if we don't disinfect well, we can again spread this virus through our hospital or other facilities. Rabies is the next virus that we'll talk about. This is a rhabdovirus. The typical patient with rabies is a free roaming cat of any age. All ages are susceptible. There may or may not be a history of an unexplained injury, which might represent a bite from a wild animal that carries rabies. And now in the United States, since widespread vaccination of dogs against rabies has reduced the incidence of rabies in that species, there are now more rabid cats than dogs. Transmission is by bite from an infected animal. The virus ascends within the muscle of the injection site to the peripheral nerves and then towards the head and the spinal cord until it gets to the brain and the salivary glands. There is a widely variable incubation period with this virus lasting from three to six weeks on average, but it has been reported that cats can carry this virus asymptomatically for more than a year before they finally get the neurologic signs. Clinical signs typically are the furious form in cats. Early on, they will have a dysesthesia or strained sensation at the site of the bite. They may or may not get an ascending paralysis from the site of the bite, and most cats will become extremely aggressive followed terminally by a paralytic form. 
There is no anti-mortem diagnosis that is reliable and available for use in cats, so rabies can only be confirmed by performing IFA on brain tissue after, cat, after the cat has died. There is no treatment for rabid cats. Prevention is by vaccination, which is very reliable, and we can only use inactivated cats, rabies vaccine in cats, because the live virus vaccines in cats have actually induced rabies in a few instances, but currently only inactivated rabies vaccines are available in this country, and this is another core vaccine that all cats should get. Let's move away from the viruses now and talk about some of the other bacterial infections that occur. Chlamydiosis is another member of the upper respiratory infection complex in cats. It used to be called uh, Chlamydia cytosi, and it's now been renamed Chlamydiophilophilus. It is an intracellular gram-negative bacteria. The typical patient, again, is any cat. This, this um, particular agent used to be credited with causing a lot of conjunctivitis and upper respiratory signs, but it's now believed to be less important as the pathogen in cats. Transmission is oculonasal. Clinical signs are conjunctivitis, upper respiratory infections, and in some animals, pneumonia or lower respiratory infections. Diagnosis is made by conjunctival scrape on which we can perform either an IFA or a PCR, or you can just do a gene sustain looking for the intracellular inclusions. Treatment is with the topical tetracyclines or with oral doxycycline. Oral tetracycline generally is not tolerated well in cats and causes fever and anorexia, so I usually prefer to use doxycycline in cats. Prevention is with vaccination. They are both killed and modified live vaccines. Again, this reduces the severity of the disease but does not necessarily prevent infection. And it is considered a non-core vaccine that should be used only in cats at risk. And we should also reduce exposure to infected cats or fomites. Hemobartonella is another bacterial disease of cats. It causes a syndrome known as feline infectious anemia. It's caused by an agent, Hemobartonella felis, and this is a red blood cell parasite, but instead of living inside the red blood cell, like other parasites do, it actually lives outside on the cell surface. It's been reclassified lately and is now believed perhaps to be a mycoplasma-like organism. The typical patient is any cat of any sex or age, and there may be an increased risk of this disease in cats that are co-infected with leukemia virus. It's not known how this particular infection is transmitted. It's suspected that arthropod vectors may be part of the transmission, but this has not been proven. Clinical signs are acute hemolytic anemia. This is a profound anemia. It's regenerative with high numbers of reticulocytes and polychromasia, and the cats that are very severely affected will also have icterus. Diagnosis is made by examination of blood smears, looking for those little epicellular organisms on the outside of the red blood cells. It's difficult, though, because the organisms may be apparent and not apparent on an hour-to-hour -hour basis on different blood smears. So if we suspect hemobartonella, it's always important to check several smears before we call the cat negative. Now, it recently has become available a PCR test, which is probably a more reliable diagnostic test for hemobartonella. And it's always advisable if cats do have an acute anemia is to try an antibiotic trial with doxycycline because sometimes it's just not possible to prove they're infected when they really are. These cats are often Coombs positive. Treatment is with doxycycline. We don't recommend tetracycline for use in cats. It's also possible that enrofloxacin is effective against this organism. Prednisone is sometimes used to stop this acute hemolytic anemia that occurs. And many cats will require a blood transfusion because they're so severely anemic. Relapse or carrier state has been shown in some cats. Prevention is unclear since we don't know for sure how this particular infection is transmitted. Certainly controlling arthropods such as fleas is very important. And we need to make sure that our blood donors are free of this disease because it's very easy to transmit with this with a contaminated blood transfusion. Bartonellosis is getting more publicity these years because recently it's been associated to, or it's been shown to be the 
an agent that causes cat scratch disease in people. The agent is Bartonella hensilae. It is an intracellular red blood cell, gram-negative parasite. The typical patient is any cat, and this is widespread in healthy pet cats. Approximately 30% of all pet cats can be shown to carry this bacteria by culture. We think that fleas can transmit this particular parasite, but there may be other causes as well. And the highest risk of zoonosis, or transmission to people, occurs with flea-infested kittens. Kittens definitely transmit this to humans more readily, perhaps because they scratch and bite more. Immune-suppressed people, such as AIDS patients or transplant patients or cancer patients, are at higher risk for getting severe disease from cat scratch disease, and this can be life-threatening. In the cat, however, it's, it's not known that any clinical signs are present with infection with this disease. Diagnosis of Bartonellosis is made by blood culture or antibody titers, which indicate exposure. Again, it's difficult to know whether any clinical disease in the cat is due to Bartonellosis because a third of cats are positive anyway. Treatment is believed to be effective with long courses of enrofloxacin, doxycycline, and rifampin, all at high doses. And we generally recommend cats be treated up to four weeks. However, it does appear that carrier states can re remain, and these cats will relapse frequently. So it's not clear yet if we can completely free these cats of infection. There is no vaccine or other preventive uh, treatment that's available other than flea control. Yersiniosis. This is the plague disease that cats can be involved with. It is most common in the southwestern United States and it's maintained in nature in rodents and lagomorphs such as rabbits. This is, the agent is Yersinia pestis. It's a gram-negative coccobacillus. Typical patient is an outdoor cat in the western United States because they have to have exposure to these intermediate hosts. Transmission is believed to be by flea transmission via wounds or across mucous membranes. There are several clinical forms that may affect cats. One is the bubonic form. In this case, cats present with fever, enlarged lymph nodes, and draining lymph node abscesses. Only about 50% of cats can survive this form. Then there's the septicemic form. These cats will prevent with fever, septic shock, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and leukocytosis. And this form is almost always fatal despite treatment. Likewise, the pneumonic form in which cats present with pneumonia is also fatal. Death or recovery from plague occurs within 14 days. Diagnosis is made by lymph node cytology, which demonstrates the typical, typical bipolar coccobacillus or by culture of the lymph nodes, abscesses. But if you're culturing agent animals that you think may have plague, it's very important to alert the laboratory that you're con considering these agents because they are highly zoonotic. It's also very important that these culture samples be shipped appropriately so no one's contaminated along the way. You can also do serum antibody titers for plague 10 to 14 days apart and antibody titers may persist for greater than a year, but usually you'll certainly have to treat cats for this disease prior to getting any antibody titers back. Treatment is with streptomycin, canamycin, genomycin, or doxycycline, usually in combination. Cats are treated for three weeks, and it's very important to start treatment immediately and not wait for confirmation of any test results because the disease progresses very rapidly. This agent is extremely stable in the outside environment, lasting weeks to months in organic material or even years if it's frozen. You must use extreme caution when handling these cats or with any of the samples because of the high zoonotic potential and high risk to people. Prophylactic antibiotics are indicated for any cat that's exposed to a one of these infected cats or any human that's been exposed. This agent is killed by routine disinfectants, and there is no vaccine available. Tularemia is another bacterial infection of cats that's seen in the western United States, caused by Francisella tularensis, the gram-negative rod. 
And a typical patient is an outdoor cat that hunts rabbits and rodents in the western United States. Transmission is via a tick rabbit cycle, and clinical signs similar to plague are fever, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, icterus, panleukopenia, and ulceration in the oral cavity. Diagnosis, again, is made by culture of lymph node aspirates and abscesses, but again, make sure you check with your lab and you ship these samples appropriately. Also, an IFA can be performed on aspirates and biopsies. Treatment is with streptomycin and genomycin in humans, but therapy has been unproven in cats. Prevention is best made by preventing exposure to these rabbits and rodents and arthropod vector, and no vaccine is available. Bordetellosis, or Bordetella bronchoseptica, is an agent that we normally think of causing kennel cough in dogs. But in the past couple years, it's been recognized as an important part of the upper respiratory complex in cats, especially in cats in environments such as shelters and catteries. The typical cat is from one of these highly populated groups. Young cats appear to be more susceptible, and there also are asymptomatic carriers that can shed this infection. Transmission is oronasal. It's moderately infectious, and so outbreaks are common. Clinical signs include fever, sneezing, nasal discharge, cough, dyspnea, and acute death. So in many ways, this bacterial infection may mimic the viral infections that we associate with cats, such as herpes and Khaleesi virus. However, when we have cats that are coughing or dyspnic, we need to think of Bordetella because it can cause a severe pneumonia. Diagnosis is made by culture, necropsy, or response to therapy. Treatment is with antibiotics that are effective against bordetellosis. In the cat, and rifloxacin has the greatest coverage. Chloramphenicol, amoxicillin, and other antibiotics are also effective. Prevention is by good husbandry, and there is an intranasal attenuated vaccine made especially for cats that may be very useful in shelter situations. Well, what about some parasitic infections now? Feline heartworm disease. This is the disease we normally think of affecting dogs. It's the same agent, Gyrofilaria imitis. The typical patient is an adult cat. 30% of the infected cats are reported by their owners to be indoors only. So it's very important to remember that indoor cats can be infected with heartworms, even though mosquitoes are required for transmission. Clinical signs of feline heartworm disease can be very vague. However, cough, dyspnea, neurologic signs, vomiting, and sudden death are the most typical signs. It looks very much like cats that have feline asthma. Diagnosis is made by serologic testing in combination with clinical signs and radiology. Antigen tests, when they're positive, are very, very reliable. However, they are not as sensitive in the cat as the dog because cats have a smaller worm burden than dogs do. Antibody tests indicate exposure to heartworms, but don't necessarily mean that the cat is currently infected. Echocardiography is very useful. In more than half of cats that are infected, we can actually see the heartworms on the echocardiogram, and that confirms infection. And chest radiographs are often very useful. We may see blunted pulmonary arteries or bronchial interstitial pattern, but we never expect to see cardiac enlargement like we do in the dog. Treatment is generally palliative. We use prednisone and bronchodilators to decrease the pulmonary effects of this infection. Cats that do not respond to medical therapy can have their worms surgically removed, but we do not recommend adulticide therapy for cats because the death of even a single worm can embolize the pulmonary artery and kill the cat. Prevention now is with several monthly products that are available and licensed for use in the cat. There's ivermectin, mobamycin, and selenectin. So we do recommend heartworm preventive therapy in any area where heartworms are highly endemic in dogs. Cryptococcosis is a fungal infection of cats caused by Cryptococcus neoformans. It's a budding yeast with a thick, non-staining capsule. The typical patient is an adult cat. Transmission is usually by inhalation, inhalation or other puncture forms, but inhalation is the most common. It is poorly transmissible, so cats don't spread it to other cats, and generally even if an entire cat is exposed to this agent, only one cat will get it, and it's not considered a zoonotic disease. 
Immune suppressed cats are more commonly affected with this. So cats with leukemia virus or FIV may be more at risk for cryptococcus. Clinical signs typically are of the nasal form. So we get nasal discharge or a nasal mass. And then if it passes past the nasal cavity into the brain, we'll also see central nervous system signs. Other forms can occur depending on where in the cat and what organ is affected. Those cats may have fevers, although cats with a nasal form typically do not have a fever. Diagnosis is made by cytology of the exudates and also on serology. We think of fungal testing titers usually representing antibody titers, but in the case of cryptococcus, this is actually an antigen titer, so it detects proteins from the yeast itself. A positive titer therefore indicates that that cat is currently infected, and the magnitude of the titer represents the response to therapy. So when we start treating cats for cryptococcus, we expect that titer to slowly fall if they're responding to therapy. And then we can also do fungal cultures. Treatment is with etraconazole or fluconazole. Cats that are suspected of having central nervous system signs should be treated with fluconazole because it gets into the CNS better. Cats are treated for a long time until the antigen titer is negative for at least one month. So generally, most cats will be treated for four to eight months, and some cats actually must remain on antifungal therapy for life. Relapse may occur after fungal therapy has been withdrawn, and there is no specific preventive for this particular fungal disease, and indoor cats can be infected. Cytozoonosis is a disease that we're seeing more commonly in Florida now. This is caused by cytozoonosis. Cytozoan felis, it's a tick-borne protozoan blood parasite. The typical cat is an outdoor cat with tick exposure, and we see these cases coinciding with the tick season in May to September in the southeastern United States, and ticks are required for transmission. Critical signs are generally a 2- to 20-day incubation period following exposure to the infected tick, and then acute severe illness, often leading to death within one week. Cats often present with ictus, anemia, dehydration, fever, and DIC. Diagnosis is made by seeing the puriplasms in the red blood cell on stained blood smears. Treatment should be begun as early as possible, and that treatment is with imidacarb, dininazine, and enrofloxacin. Supportive care is very important because these cats are usually critically ill, and prevention is by keeping cats indoors or using products that prevent tick exposure. Sporoprecosis is a fungal agent of cats. It's also called Rose Gardener's disease. This particular agent is widely spread in the environment, so people frequently get it from uh, gardening if they scratch themselves. However, they can also get it from cats, making it a zoonosis. It's caused by Sporophyx chenchii. It's a dimorphic fungus, and the typical patient is an outdoor cat again with exposures to the outdoors. Transmission is by cutaneous inoculation. So cats are scratched in some way and become infected through the skin. Draining lesions are most common on the head, lower legs, and tail base. And these can resemble cat bite abscesses, and so veterinarians can become infected when they think they're treating a cat bite abscess. Diagnosis is made by cytology of the exudates or fungal cultures or histopathology. You need to be very careful when handling these samples and make sure that you're using a biohazard laboratory and that you're shipping these samples safely because this is a zoonotic disease. Treatment is with etraconazole for one month past the clinical cure. And this is usually our recommendation for the treatment of fungal diseases. We treat until clinical signs have been gone for at least a month. There is significant zoonotic potential with this agent so make sure that everybody's using adequate precautions not to be directly exposed to the exudates of the cat. And then there are no specific preventives except keeping cats indoors. Microsporum canis is the most common fungal infection of cats. This is dermatophyte infection known as ringworm. Kittens are most susceptible, and also catteries and shelter cats that are confined in large numbers in a small area. Persians appear to have a genetic pre-susceptibility to this infection, and they can often become lifelong carriers when they're infected. Transmission is by direct contact or by fomites. 
This agent is highly persistent in the environment and can last for more than a year, so it's easy to spread it even if cats don't have direct cat-to-cat -cat contact. It is highly infectious, unlike other fungal infections, and so outbreaks are common. Diagnosis is made by a woods lamp, and approximately 50% of cats with dermatophyte infection will be positive by glowing with woods lamp. We also do fungal cultures, or you can look at cytology using a KOH preparation. Treatment is a combination of topical and systemic therapy. Topical therapy includes lime sulfur dips, clotrimazole, and myconazole creams. Systemic therapy is with griseofulbin or etraconazole. It should be noted that griseofulbin causes birth defects and pancytopenia, and so we never want to use these this particular drug in pregnant animals, and it should never be used in cats with FIV because they can develop fatal pancytopenia. It's also recently been reported that lucineron at high doses cures ringworm, and so we're eagerly watching for more information that this appears to be a new drug with high efficacy against ringworm infection in cats. We treat for a minimum of eight weeks or two weeks past negative cultures. Clinical signs of microsporum canis are typically round, scaly, non-paritic patches of skin, but it can lead to generalized infection or miliary dermatitis. Prevention is by avoiding exposure to infected cats, again, making sure that any contaminated environment is well cleaned. It is very resistant to routine disinfectants. Bleach is the only disinfectant that will work, and it has very high zoonotic potential. People are very susceptible to ringworm from cats. This concludes the lecture portion of our seminar today, and it's not possible to cover all of the important infectious diseases of cats. You will be having other lectures in this series that cover some of these other topics, and so I urge you to fill in any gaps with these other diseases I've mentioned here in our other topics. And thank you for your attention today.